issues this morning for missing six-year-old Faith Swetlick. The last time we heard from investigators yesterday evening, they told us that they are following up on every lead and asking for help from the public to help bring this little girl home safely. Just before 3 p.m., six-year-old Faye Marie Swetlick skipped off the school bus from Springdale Elementary School. She met her mother Selena and they walked the short distance back home, talking about their days. Faye was described as bright, funny and lively, with bundles of energy. Selena called her her magical little fairy, that always wanted to play and have fun. Her mother said she loved everyone and everything, and always wanted people to be as happy as she was. Selena said her daughter was always the first one to give a compliment, even randomly to people she's never met before. We couldn't go anywhere without her stopping three or four different people to compliment them, be it their hair or if a colour looked good on them, and she always wanted to make new friends. When they got home, Faye had a small snack before she went out to play in the yard, something she did a lot, with neighbours confirming they often saw her. Selena was regularly checking outside and keeping an eye out and nothing seemed out of the ordinary. A neighbour reported to having seen Faye running towards a shared fence with NAPA auto parts sometime between 3.30 and 4pm. At around 3.45pm, Selena checked outside again. Her daughter Faye was gone. After running around to all the neighbours, making several calls and searching the area, she phoned 911 at 5pm. Right, and tell me exactly what's happening. <laughs> I can't. We can't find my daughter. She was playing outside, and now I can't find her. And I. Okay, how old is she? She is six. She's gonna be okay. seven in June. All right, all right. I'm gonna stand on the line with you, but I'm gonna get KC KCPD on the line too. But I'm gonna stand on the line, so don't hang up, okay? Okay. Okay, ma'am. Right, ma you're on the yes. phone with Casey. Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Can you tell me what your son's name is? Uh, my daughter's name is Faye Swatwick. F-A-Y-E. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Hold, hold on. Okay. All right. What was the first name again? Faye. Faye? F-A-Y-E? Yes, ma'am. Okay. What's your last name? Swatwick. Spell that for me. S-W-E-T-L-I-K. Okay. And what was she wearing? Uh, she was wearing uh, polka dotted rain boots, uh, um, a flowered skirt. Okay. And, um, and a black kind of shirt. A black t-shirt that has um, a neon design on it. And how long has she been gone? Um, last time I, last I saw her was probably about an hour ago. How tall is she? Oh, uh, she is three foot ten. Three foot. How much does she weigh? Oh, uh, 65 pounds. All right. You last saw her in the front yard. You didn't see which way she went or anything like that. No, she was just right in, right, like right in front of my front porch. Minutes later, the police arrived at the house, and by 5:30, 50 responders would be on scene. Everything was moving at a rapid pace, and at 6pm, the Federal Bureau of Investigation got involved, as well as the community springing into action. Everyone wanted to help, but police urged citizen volunteers to stand down and let the professionals handle the search. Chad Swetlick, Faye's father, was soon informed that she was missing, and FBI agents would soon be at his house to search it. But Faye wasn't there, and phone records would later confirm that Chad was at home at the time his daughter had gone missing. Officers had already started going door to door and asked neighbours with security cameras to contact them and turn in any footage. It comes to checking on those home security cameras, that's something that uh, we're already doing. Certainly we'll be going, uh, continue to go door to door and, and then even revisit some of these doors a second time. Ashley Hunter, a spokesperson for the city of Casey, asked that the community continue to share recordings with law enforcement. 
people in the community, uh, in the Churchill Heights community, if you have uh, home security systems, uh, ring, wise video, anything like that, talk with our investigators and, and let them reach out and, and obtain some of that video. The FBI provided a helicopter and K-9 officers were deployed as well. Despite all of this, Department of Public Safety's Chief Byron Snellgrove said at the time there did not appear to be enough evidence to point to this being an abduction and Faye's disappearance didn't meet the criteria for an Amber Alert. At 7am the next morning a hotline was set up and almost 300 tips would come in. Police would follow up on every lead, but nothing came back. More than 250 officers and investigators from agencies across the country had now joined in the hunt for Faye. Roadblocks were set up around the Churchill Heights area and every car coming in and out was searched. It had now been almost 24 hours since Selena had made the 911 call. A press conference was held to share some more details. We've all been gathered here for one thing today and that's to find Faye. The last time Faye was seen, she was wearing a black shirt with the word peace across the front of it. The photos that you have, her hair is a little bit longer uh, than it is today. We're trying to get pictures of that. But it's been cut to about shoulder length or just above. Faye's parents are anxiously awaiting her return. What we would like to ask is that you hold on to a phone number. 803-205-4444. And we specifically asked that the residents of Churchill Heights here in Casey, who have cameras such as surveillance cameras around their houses, uh, uh, doorbell cameras, ring doorbell cameras, anything like that, anything that records, and have any type of recording on their devices between the time of 2 and 5 p.m. yesterday, please call us at that number. Let us know that you have that recording. We'll come get it, look at it, and it may be key in us proceeding with this case. Now again, we're here for one reason. We're here to find Faye. Authorities still didn't know if Faye had simply walked away from her home and become lost, or maybe injured, or if she'd been abducted. But by now, it was seeming less and less likely that the six-year-old had gone off of her own accord. Investigators released footage from the local school bus to show everyone what Faye was wearing that afternoon, hoping to generate some more leads. She was wearing polka dot rain boots and a black t-shirt with the word peace on it. During their intensive search, authorities interviewed a number of people, including Selena, her living boyfriend Carter, and Faye's father Chad. At this point in time, police said they weren't ruling anyone out, and one of the detectives said there were no clear suspects. But members of Faye's family would soon be cleared after searches of homes, analysis of phone records, and alibis ruled everyone out. On February 12th, police released an image of two cars seen leaving the area Faye lived in around the time she was last seen but the drivers of the cars were quickly located and ruled out as well, and the police were back at square one. There was still no sign of Faye, and no clues pointing to where she might be. The morning of Thursday, February 13th, was the scheduled day for the bins to be collected and emptied. Officers quickly needed to do one last search before any evidence in anyone's bin was taken away. While they were searching through the bins at the homes around Piccadilly Square, they found something at number 602, and clearly, just in time. They described the evidence as critical, but didn't immediately reveal what it was. Whatever they had found, it led them back to the woods. After quickly pulling together and remapping the route and area they needed to focus on, less than half an hour later, the search for Faye Swetlick would come to a devastating end. Byron Snellgrove was looking through the wooded area once more when he found her body in a shallow grave, less than 200 feet from her home. It would later be determined that she had died of asphyxiation just hours after she had been abducted and her body had been moved. 
A mere matter of minutes after Faye was found, officers were alerted to something else back at Piccadilly Square. A man had been found, bleeding and dead, on his back porch. He was not identified, and police initially kept quiet about whether or not there was a link between the two. Since our last briefing this morning, we have had several developments to share with you. It is with extremely heavy hearts that we are announcing that we have found the body that the coroner has, has identified as Faye Marine Sweatland. We are now treating this case as a homicide. As this community has been working hard to find Faye and bring her home safely, we wanted you to know as soon as possible. At this time, no arrests have been made. You need to know that this is a fluid investigation and that we are working diligently on it. We also need to inform you that during the course of our investigation, a deceased male was located in the Churchill Heights neighborhood. That investigation has just begun. At this time, we feel there is no danger to the community. We will continue to provide more information as it becomes available. We will not be taking questions. Thank you. Following the discovery of Faye's body, tributes came pouring in, and the sense of loss was felt by many. All I could think of was my own kids, if something were to happen to them. Oh, I think it was terrible. Um, I feel bad for the family. I feel bad for all the people involved. The former Vice President Mike Pence even gave a statement offering his full support to the police as they continued to investigate the case. And as your Vice President and as a father, let me say, we were deeply saddened to receive word this afternoon that the remains of Faye Swetnick, a six-year-old girl who went missing from her parents' front yard just three days ago had been found. A few moments ago, I spoke on the phone with FBI Director Christopher Wray, and uh, I have assured Governor McMaster uh, that he will continue to have the full resources of the federal government made available in this investigation. The man that had been found on his porch would soon be revealed to be 30-year-old Cody Scott Taylor. But who was he, and what link, if any, did he have to Faye? After a little girl disappeared from her yard, investigators are now revealing more details about her death. Police say that the body of a man found in the same South Carolina neighborhood is connected to the death of six-year-old Faye Swetlick. Those who knew Cody said he was a loner who constantly had a negative outlook on life. They claimed that Cody had described himself as someone that lived without hope, was asexual and an incel. He lived with the roommates who he worked with and his roommate said that Cody had expressed feelings of depression as well as suicidal thoughts, and he mostly kept to himself. Cody had enrolled at the University of South Carolina at Columbia and studied mathematics, but there is no record of him graduating, and according to some sources, he dropped out in 2009. Aside from a few traffic violations, he had no history with the police. He had moved between jobs a lot, but was working at a wing stop alongside his roommate at the time. As soon as they found Cody's body, police began to piece everything together and connected the dots over the coming hours and days. Although he seemingly had no link to Faye in any way, the evidence the police described as critical was found in the bin that belonged to his home. Investigators believe that Cody took Faye from her yard, but it remains unconfirmed how he abducted her and whether he used any kind of force or lured her away. It is believed that he asphyxiated her in a matter of hours after abducting her and somehow managed to conceal her body in his apartment for two days without investigators finding her when they searched the place twice. On February 12th, while searching the area, police had actually knocked on the door of Cody and his roommate. Cody wasn't home, so officers spoke to his roommate and took a look around. A full laundry bag was in the house, one which his roommate identified as Cody's, and detectives took a DNA sample from it. 
They also noted the Faye's missing persons poster was lying on a table. After they were done with the search of the property, Cody's roommate's alibi had checked out. The investigators left. When Cody returned from work that day, his roommate recalled him acting in a strange and erratic way. His roommate would also soon realise that since Faye had been missing, the apartment had started to develop a strong and odd smell. He said he initially dismissed the odour as being cheap air freshener that Cody was using to try and conceal the smell of weed, but his roommate did note that Cody never actually used air freshener and this in itself seemed strange. Later that day, just before 6pm, police returned to search the pair's apartment again, this time hoping to get an interview with Cody, which they did. When he was asked about his whereabouts, he was unable to give them a strong enough alibi. He said he was sleeping at home, alone. Officers left again, finding nothing out of place. But they would soon realise, that same day, a surveillance camera was collecting footage which would become invaluable. The footage showed officers going through the wooded area in their search for Faye. At around 1am on what was now February 13th, the same camera picked up something else. It captured a light coming from a spot in the same area of woods. Someone was moving around in the dark and using something to light up the area. Someone police would later confirm was Cody Taylor. Six hours later, just before 7am, cameras picked up Cody walking through the streets and going to a Walmart on Augusta Road. He wandered around the garden department for about 20 minutes, telling an employee he was working on his garden, but didn't know what to buy. According to sources, Cody's roommate was emphatic that Cody had no interest in gardening. He also told investigators that Cody rarely had discretionary money, but had just gotten some money from his workplace in the hours before the trip. The employee at Walmart would later tell police Cody grabbed random seeds from a display and appeared to have no plan for his garden. Around 10 minutes later, he paid for several bags of soil and fertilizer, plus a box of Pop-Tarts and left. Cody then booked a ride through the app Lyft. According to the driver, Cody made him feel very uncomfortable, and when the driver casually asked if he was doing some gardening, he dodged the conversation. While driving, they went past some police and other media who were out looking for Faye. The driver asked him if he knew her, and Cody replied, I don't know her, I never met her before. About 40 minutes later, at 7.47am, the camera that had picked up Cody moving around in the woods in the dark also captured more in the same spot. Police determined that Cody was carrying one of the bags of soil he had just purchased up into the woods where he would bury Faye. He stays for about a minute before heading back down the hill without the bag. When the police searched the bins of Cody's home, they had found a child's polka dot rain boot and a ladle covered in dirt. Following this huge find, they headed to the woods to conduct another search. CCTV footage showed the moment that Casey Public Safety Director Byron Snellgrove discovered Faye's partially buried body next to her other tiny polka dot boot. A white plastic trash bag was wrapped around her neck. Cody Taylor then stood on his back porch and slit his throat with a knife. As well as the CCTV and the evidence found in Cody's bin, they would soon gather more. When Faye's body was examined, she was found to have Cody's DNA under her fingernails. Her DNA was also found on the ladle, along with Cody's, and both sets of DNA were found in the black laundry bag. All endings, evidence and facts point to the exact same conclusion. Cody Taylor abducted and murdered Faye Marie Swetlick and was the sole perpetrator of this horrible case, said Byron Snellgrove. They also believed that Cody acted alone. 
It was announced that Faye's funeral expenses would be covered by a funeral home, and on February 21st, a public memorial was held for her. That was Faye Swetlick's favorite song. And it was a somber night for the city of KC as the community said goodbye to the six-year-old who captured the hearts of so many. Trinity Baptist Church opened its doors to hundreds who came to pay their respects to Faye. And before the service tonight, people lined the streets for this procession from her home in the Churchill Heights neighborhood to the church. This colorful tow truck carried Faye, her mother, and her pink bicycle to the service. David Bates is the owner of Diligent Towing in Lexington. He's also a neighbor and friend of Faye Swetlick's family. So he reached out to Faye's family and asked how he could help. He offered up his pink tow truck to escort Faye's mother and her ashes to Trinity Baptist Church for her memorial service. The community's come together 100%. I mean, we're all blessed to be a part of this. The pink truck towing Faye's bicycle on the back joined dozens of motorcycles and tow trucks for the two-mile procession to the church. One by one, motorcycles and trucks pulled into the church, greeted by hundreds more there to show their respect for the little girl who made a big impact during her short time here on earth. Faye will be somebody that we remember for the rest of our lives. Hundreds of people, including first responders and officers, turned out to pay their respects, with many wearing pink and purple, Faye's favorite colors. In Selena's words, the sparklier, the better. Faye loved getting letters and writing notes, so journals were set up and her family wanted everyone to write a few words or draw a picture in colourful pens. It would take a year for the authorities to officially close the case. It's impossible to know exactly what happened that afternoon and why it did. Police confirmed that all the evidence pointed one way, but sadly... There are still so many more questions that can never be answered. No motive has ever been determined for the crime, and likely never will be. Cody left no suicide notes or any other information in his home, indicating why he had done this. Multiple agencies have tried to access the data from Cody's phone but have not succeeded, and no evidence was found on his computer. While Casey Police concluded their part, the FBI investigation is still ongoing, as is a review by the State Law Enforcement Division. In July 2021, the director of Casey Department of Public Safety, Byron Snellgrove, who played such a vital role in Faye's case, announced his retirement after more than 35 years in law enforcement. For me, after 65 hours of searching, the memory of finding the small body of Faye Marie Swetlick in a shallow grave on the morning of February 13th, 2020, will never, ever leave me. This tragic case has taken a toll on officers who were dedicated to finding her. Nearly one year later, they haven't forgotten. The disappearance and murder of Faye Marie Swetlick immediately became, and always will remain, incredibly personal for each of us. Faye's death evidently had a profound impact on the community in which she lived, one that will continue to be felt for a long time to come. Springdale Elementary School unveiled a buddy bench that had been dedicated in memory of Faye. If you feel like you don't have a friend to play with. You can go to, you can sit down on a buddy bench and somebody else will come and sit down with you and talk to you or somebody will come up to you knowing that you need a friend. And then, I mean, kids are awesome that way and then they can go and play together. In Selena's eulogy for her daughter, she asked that people continue to honor Faye's memory through love, something she said was the most important magic. She asked that they try and be a little more like Faye, to be more kind, to compliment a stranger, to dance in the rain, to stop and smell the flowers, to just show a little bit more love to everyone you meet.